Hello and welcome to this session in which we would look at the equity section part two of two. Simply put, in the prior session we looked we looked at the equity method part one of two. So this is the second part of the equity method. I already covered the fair value, the cost accounting, the cost method. And in previous session we're gonna cover consolidation in depth. Basically this topic talks about when do we use those accounting method to account for investments. Remember depending on our degree of control this is basically a review up to 20 percent if you control up to 20 percent of the company your two options are the fair value and the cost method if you control between 20 to 50 and remember we learn about that this rule is not really 100 percent applicable in the real world sometimes you might control less than 20 you, you would use the equity method sometime more than 20 and not use the equity method in the real world but as far as we're concerned between 20 to 50 this is what we use, the equity method. And if you control 50% plus, this is where we'll use consolidation. And once again, sometimes you may not have to have 50 control plus to use consolidation. Sometimes you might have 50 control plus to use and you don't use the consolidation. We talked about those different situations in the prior session. Those are the exceptions. Those are where the case is not really clear. You have to actually look at the control. This topic is extremely important, whether you are an accounting student or a CPA candidate studying for the CPA exam. So I strongly suggest you take a look at my website, Farhat lectures.com most likely most likely you do have a cpa review course if you're studying for the cpa exam that's fine i don't intend to replace your cpa review course my explanation is to be a useful addition to your cpa review course help you understand the material better provide you with alternative explanation and alternative resources exercises through false multiple choice to help you understand your risk to try me is one month of subscription you try it you like it you keep it you don't, you cancel. You lost $30, your maximum gain is passing the exam. Are you willing to take that risk? And if not for anything, take a look at my website to find out how well or not well your university doing on the CPA exam. I do have resources for other courses as well if you are an accounting student. Also connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. And take a look at my LinkedIn recommendation. Like this recording, connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. In part two, we're going to be reporting change to the equity method, reporting investee income from sources other than continuing operation, which is part of it will be OCI, reporting investee losses, and reporting sale of an equity investment. So what happened once we sell the equity investment, starting with the reporting of change to the equity method. What happened? What are we talking about here? Well, you might start with less than 20% at first when you invest in a company, then you might add more and more to your investment to get to a point where you control, where you own between 20 to 50. And remember, once you own 20 to 50, the, the equity method will kick in. Now you have to use the equity method because less than 20, we, you have to use the fair value. So FASB requires you that you do a prospective, treat this as a prospective approach. Prospective means easy. You don't have to go back and change the prior year. You have to take whatever you did up to this point and start using the new method, which will be the equity method, going now from non-equity to equity. So it's basically, we're requiring the cost of the new investment simply to be added to the current investment carrying amount. So when you purchase a new investment, it gets added just like when you buy an investment. It's recorded at cost. For example, January 2020, Alpha Company Exchange, $84,000 cash for 10% ownership in Bailey. So we assume we have no significant influence. We use the fair value. And this is the data for Bailey Company. So this is January 1st. This is the fair value when we purchased it. This is the book value. And at the end of the year, the, the fair value was 890,000. Therefore, our investment is worth 89,000. How do I know this? We own 10%. We have to adjust it to fair value. So this is the investment. January 1st, 2021, which is the following year, we purchased an additional 30,000. This is plus 30, sorry, not 30,000, an additional 30%, plus 30%. Well, we had 10 plus 30, we're up to 40, and we paid 267. Let's take a look at the journal entry because now we have significant influence. 40% should give you significant influence. Now, investment in Bailey, 260. 67 credit cash 267 this is to record the initial investment on january 1st 2021 
the carrying amount of the asset and the liability equal to the fair value except for an undervalued uh, which uh, patent so we have an undervalued patent by 175,000 that has a 10-year life what does that mean it means the assets uh, the fair value of the assets were the same at, uh, as the book value okay the, which is I'm sorry the same as the book value 289,000 except for one except for one asset which was undervalued by 175,000 okay what does that mean well when we started this comp when we purchased this company when we started this purchase this new purchase the value of the company was 890,000 times 10% i told you the value was 89,000 now we are going to add 267,000 to this asset which will give us a total value book value of 356,000 now the book value of the assets are 715,000 this is the book value and we own 40 percent 715 times 40 percent it's going to give us 286,000 well we have an access of 70,000 and what did we say this access it's going to be allocated to it's going to be allocated to the patent and what's going to be it's going to be and it's going to be expensed amortized over 10 years so 70 divided by 10 is 7,000 and this is the computation this is the computation Okay. Now, what's going to happen is this. Let's assume Bailey reports net income of 130000 and declared dividend of 50000 What do we have to do? Well, we're going to have to increase our investment by the income. Well, how do we do so? Well, we debit investment in Bailey. And let's take a look at this. If we take, if we take 130000 times 0.4, which is our ownership, it's going to give us 52000 52,000. So why did we record 45,000? Well, we record 45,000 because we also have a patent. Remember, at an excess cost of 70,000 divided by 10, we have to amortize 10,000. So when we amortize 10,000, 52 minus 7, it's going to give us 45. So simply put, we combine the two entries. Otherwise, we had to debit equity and in investee income, 7,000 credit and investment in Bailey. So what we have to do really is to do this as if when I break it down into two, this will be 52,000. Then we have to debit equity, investee income, 7,000 credit investment in Bailey. 7,000 and those two together will give us the entry that we have of of uh, of 45,000 but all we did is we combined them also for the dividend we debit dividend receivable 20,000 credit investment in Bailey 20,000 when we receive the cash we debit cash credit dividend receivable so this is how we account for this so how do we report investees other comprehensive income and irregular items. Those items, they bypass the income statement. OCI is bypass the income statement and irregular items could be discontinued operations. So how do we report for this, okay? OCI, you need to know what this is, other comprehensive income. It's earning that bypass net income, earning or losses for that matter, accumulated derivatives, net gains or losses. You need to be familiar with those from intermediate accounting, foreign currency translation adjustment, search certain pension adjustments. So what we do, we either have a loss or a gain, but we don't report on the income statement. We report in the equity section of the balance sheet. Also, we could have, again, as I said, as irregular items, we could have discontinued operation. So the equity method require us that the investor record its share of investees OCI which is included in the balance sheet as accumulated other comprehensive income, AOCI. So if they have OCI, we have to absorb part of that OCI. Okay, for example, big company purchase 30% of the voting stock of small company. We have significant influence. No access amortization resulted from this investment. That's fine. In 2020, they reported income of half a million. Excellent. We debit investment, 150. Credit equity investing in income, 150. This is for the 30%. I'm sorry, yeah, for the 30% of half a million. Now, small company also reported, notice, 80,000 in OCI from pension and other adjustments gained. So they have a gain of uh, 80,000. Well, what does that mean? Well, if a small company reported this OCI, our share of that OCI is 24,000. We debit investment in small company. We credit OCI, other comprehensive income of investee. We have to absorb 30% 
of that, simply put. Now, if we had a discontinued operation, let's assume small company discontinued one of their operation, and they either have a gain or a loss, that gain or a loss will be reported as regular income. It's not reported separately, although it's reported separately on the income statement, but what we do is it will be part of the regular income. Impairment and in equity investment is something else that we have to deal with as part of our equity investment. Okay, what is impairment? Impairment is when the company suffer a permanent loss in the value of the investment. So you purchase an investment, but it's a permanent loss. Permanent loss, it's going to go down, and there's no chance it's going to go up. Now, why would that happen? Reason for impairment. We have made a lot of reasons for impairment, many, many reasons, but could be you lost a major customer, and that's your major customer, and as a result, you know, the investment in this company, because they rely on this customer, it's going to go down permanently. They cannot recover. Changes in economic conditions. Could COVID could be one of them. Loss of significant patent or other legal rights. So you used to rely on a patent or some legal right, and you lost those. Damage to the company's reputation and many others. Okay, what do you have to do? A loss in value, which is other than temporary. Other than temporary means permanent, because if it's temporary, you don't do anything. If it's temp if it's permanent, it shall be recognized. You just have to book the loss, okay? Evidence of the loss might include, but would not be necessarily limited to the absence of the ability to recover the carrying amount of the investment or the inability of the investee to sustain earning capacity that would justify carrying the amount of the investment. So simply put, there's a test for impairment. And if that test is, if you pass the test of impairment, you have to absorb the losses. You have to absorb impairment losses. You have to record them once you know that they are permanent not temporary because sometime also because because of COVID, maybe your investment will go down but it's only temporary but because if it's COVID and it's permanent then you have to write it down you just have to write down your investment take a loss and sometime you could have you have to reduce your investment to zero now why would the investment would be reduced to zero well you have to understand how the equity investment work and the equity investment when you purchase the investment you record it at cost then in subsequent years, you might have net income. And when you have net income, it's going to increase the investment. Well, if you suffer, let's assume you suffer a loss. Well, when you suffer a loss, it's the opposite. So this is how you would treat a loss. A loss would reduce your investment. So when you have a loss, you're going to debit loss from investee, and you're going to credit the investment. And this is what we're talking about here. You debit the loss and you credit the investment. So you have a loss, but the investment will go down. Now, also what could happen, remember, when we receive dividend, dividend also reduces the investment. Also, what we learned, if you have an impairment, just basically treated the same thing. Loss from impairment, debit, investee, investment gets a credit. Also, it's going to go down. So what happened, if over, over the years you withdrew money, you incurred NL net loss and you incurred impairment, Whatever you have, if you incur, if you have more more credits than debits, well, you could have a negative balance. You cannot have a negative balance. You could reduce it down to zero, and it cannot have a negative balance, and keep track of that account separately until you recover. You bring it back to zero, then you bring it back to the books. So it could be reduced down to zero due to losses, dividend payout, impairment losses. And also what happens sometimes is you can sell your equity investments. So the investor can choose to sell all of it or part of it. It doesn't really matter. If a sale occur, you know, the equity continue to be applied until the transaction date up to that date. That's establishing the appropriate carrying amount of the investment. Assuming that the after the sale, you still have significant influence. You just keep on going. If this, if you stop to have significant influence after the sale, then from the sale date, you have to treat it as a fair value, let's assume you go down to fair value, okay? The investor reduces the balance by the percentage of the shares sold, assuming you're selling part of it. The best way to illustrate this is to work an example. Assume top company owns 40% of the outstanding shares of bottom company, which is an equity investment. Any excess cost over top shares bottom is considered goodwill. So we have goodwill, we don't have to worry about reducing the access. The asset balance is 320,000 as of January 1st, 2021. Bottom report net income of 70,000 during the first six months of 2021 and declare cash dividend of 30,000. Excellent. What do we have to do now? We have to debit investment in bottom increase for the six month net income of 28,000, which is 70,000 times 40% and 
increase our equity income by 28,000. Then we have to do the same thing with the dividend. Debit and dividend receivable, deb credit investment and income. Then when we receive the cash, debit cash, credit receivable. Remember, again, we can remove the receivable, debit cash, credit investment. Okay, now bear in mind the balance was 320,000 at the beginning of the year. Add 28 for the income, subtract 12 from the from the dividend, you end up with 336,000 as of the date of the sale. So this is important because we have to determine what happened after this balance, after the date. Okay, so they're telling you the income is 70,000 and 30,000. If they don't tell you the income for the for the first six months is that much, they give you the yearly income, then you have to prorate per year, which is you allocate half to the first six months and the other half, assuming you're using the equity method for the following six months. If you lose the equity method, now use goodwill because you sold so many, then you basically ignore net income for subsequent period because now you're using the fair value method. Assume in July 1st, which when the balance was 336,000, you sold 10,000 of the 40,000 shares, which is one fourth, and you received 110,000. And you reduced your ownership from 40 to 30 because you had 40, so you're still using the equity method. Let's take a look at the journal entry. Well, you received cash 110. One fourth, if we take 336 divided by four, one fourth is 84,000. So you sold something that's worth 84,000 for 110, you have a gain of 26. Now, if you sold it for less than 84, let's assume you sold it for 80,000, let's assume you sold it for 80,000, then you would have a, rather than a gain, you'll have a loss of 4,000. You, you would have a loss of 4,000. Okay, but you did not. You sold it at a gain. Therefore, you have a gain. After the sale is complete, we, we're going to keep using the equity method because we're still above 30%. If the sale, let's assume you sold rather than 10, you sold all the way up to 25 and you reduce your ownership to 15. Now you'd have to use the fair value. How would the fair value be used? Simply put, you're going to take the remaining, whatever the 15%, the 15% of the 336, 336, times 15%. This will be your balance as of July 1st, which is 15% of the company. You still have 15,000 shares. At the end of the year, you would look at the fair value of those 15,000 shares and you adjust them. You, you, you ignore net income, you ignore dividend because you will start to use the fair value method. Okay. So the remaining book value becomes the new cost and you just keep going. No retrospective adjustment. It's all prospective. So you don't have to worry about going back and changing the prior years. And the and we looked at the beginning of the session if we change from the equity method change to the equity method if we went from fair value to equity also it's considered prospectively which is easy you don't have to back you don't have to go back and change any prior years again at the end of this recording i would like to remind you that if you are a cpa candidate check out my website farhatlectures.com i can be a useful addition to your cpa review course i can explain the material differently your risk is one month don't shortchange yourself. You invest in your career once in your lifetime. Pass the CPA once. Good luck. Study hard. And of course, stay safe.